Welcome to Godfather TV with our host, Jeff Dennis, Charles Encinas, Al Mead, with tonight's guest, George Call. Hello, DFW, and welcome to the flagship episode of Godfather TV. We are here to give you everything uh, rock and metal that DFW has to offer. I am your co-host, Chuck Insinius. Behind the scenes back here is our production god, Mr. Al Mead. And it gives me the esteemed pleasure to introduce the godfather himself, Mr. Jeff Dennis. How's it going, Jeff? Hello, everybody. Like you said, this is the godfather, Jeff Dennis. Welcome to our debut episode. And we could not be more excited than to have with, I think, maybe the biggest rock star in town right now, most successful career for sure, and you'll soon find all about, out all about it. George Call is here tonight from Aska, Plovenhoof, Banshee, Ex-Omen, <laughs> Legion of the Dog, Emerald, Dreamer Deceiver, and many more. So, without further ado, we're going to start uh, talking to George here. What's up, my brother hey, George? Brother George, from you another mother. Man. It's a, a complete pleasure to be here with you two rock and roll uh, scenester stalwarts that have been, uh, you know, doing it at every show and on stage through DFW for years and years. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here on your uh, inaugural show. Now, George, you've been in town for about 30 years now, right? 31 years. Uh, you got to Dallas around the early 90s, 91, somewhere in there? I, I, it was about the uh, uh, late 80s. Okay, late the, 80s? Yeah, when he... Um, and, and you are, grew up in the Panama Canal, the canal right? Canal Zone, yeah. The Canal, canal zone. zone, which is a former... Can you tell us about that and uh, how you got your start and your earliest influences and how you ended up in Texas? Um, well, to, to start, my dad was from Texas, um, so... We always knew, you know, the Canal Zone um, had a limited lifespan since in uh, 77, 78, Jimmy Carter signed some treaties to give away the territory, to return the territory of the Canal Zone back, back to the Republic of Panama. So pretty much everybody that grew up there knew that um, we would be leaving at um, one point or the other. Um, I knew that I would be, you know, coming to my dad's home state. I had family here. Uh, and I also, more importantly than that, I had a, a drummer that had played in a band of mine in high school who was a military brat. His name was Rob Nelson. And he had, um, he was stationed at Fort Bliss, uh, which is in El Paso. Um, Rob and I, of course, had kept in touch. And um, so he was the, basically the anchor. That was the, the line that, that brought me um, to Texas. So initially, uh, my uh, first foray into this country was in El Paso. And uh, of course, I don't think I need to tell anybody here that um, the scene there, the rock scene was pretty much dead. It was on life support anyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, there were some cool bands and um, I ran into some uh, really cool people that, um, you know, even people that I'd seen playing, they were a few years uh, before me in bands in Panama, you know, other military brats, other, other kids that had, um, growing up in the military and whatnot. And uh, so it was cool for that, you know, to kind of see what was out there, um, get the feet wet. But um, it soon became clear that uh, as far as trying to get a, uh, a music thing going, a rock and roll uh, career going in El Paso, it, it wasn't going to uh, come to fruition. So uh, we kind of, you know, like the Beverly Hillbillies did, we, we loaded up the, uh, the old 74 beat up uh, Toyota pickup, put our belongings in and, and uh, went on the Texas tour, um, which was the, the other ASCA co-founder and I, Darren Knapp. Um, we hit San Antonio, Austin, we came to Dallas, Fort Worth, we went to Houston, we went to all the cities that were, um, that people knew and you know, that the big cities, uh, so to speak, San Antonio, which was the, the uh, capital of heavy metal. Um, and, uh, we, we saw what they all had to offer because our, our point was to relocate, you know. Um, so we, uh, we ended up the, choosing Dallas Fort Worth because the first night we got here, um, I had, you know, cousins, I had family in town and whatnot. And they're like, oh, great, you came. It's a Friday night. Great. You guys couldn't have picked a better time. Come on, we're going to take you on a strip. And immediately they took us down to, um, 
UTA, which is uh, University of Texas at Arlington, not Austin, mm -hmm. uh, here in, uh, in the area. And we went down there to Cooper Mitchell Street, which is a cross section that apparently all the young people, you know, the kids and the young adults used to cruise. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody here remembers cruising yeah, or what that was Dude, all about. It was more like the late 70s for me, but yeah. yeah we, but we had a version of that. I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico. We had a version of that too. One street was called Riverside, downtown Santa Fe, up and down for like four hours, man. But uh, <laughs> hey, going back to El Paso, Our just real quick. Before you left El Paso, how much Chico's Tacos did you have before you left? <laughs> I had it. I, I'll tell you what, I had it uh, more than once. It was. It's kind of an institution down there, right? Chico's Tacos, we better get free stuff next time we're there. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, with the, the cruising thing, the, the very first night we get there, we go to my cousin's, he takes us down there to that strip. And, you know, within 15 minutes of being on that strip, Darren and I end up in a Trans Am with these two blondes. You know, so we're like, whoa, we're moving here. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it's that easy, huh? It was that, I mean, it was like, <laughs> was, uh, and also, I mean, another factor that played, of course, that I had the family in, in town, and another factory, uh, factor was that um, you had two major cities within uh, spitball distance of each other. You know, within an hour, you've got Dallas, you've got Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. Fort Worth more rustic, Dallas more urban. Um, and we figured, man, we'll just work both these cities at once. And then uh, when it's time to branch out, we'll do that. So there was some strategy to it, but um, I think the deciding factor was the chicks in the Trans Am. There you go, there man. You go. That had to be it. That does it every time. <laughs> every now, time. when you guys first started out, uh, I think first time I saw you guys was like 1991 in, at the On the Rocks, or maybe it was Dallas City Limits, but y'all were wearing like camouflage really? on stage. Wow. And uh, I wouldn't say y'all blew me away. It was no. like y'all did a lot of cover songs. <laughs> a lot, yeah. And... I I like to watch y'all's growth over the years. I like the later years, of course, better than the early years. But then I started hearing that you guys were leaving the country and playing all over the world, actually. And I thought, wow, well, that's no. nobody here's doing that. So why don't more people know about that? I mean, how did that all come to be? Um, that's a, an interesting story. Um, in 91, when we started, it was our first album. And of course, back then, like you say, we were, we, we knew the, the difficulty in being an original band in a scene that was, uh, you know, now everybody cries about tribute bands, but back then it was all cover bands. You know, everybody was playing mm -hmm. covers. So, uh, you know, we, you had to fit in, you know, you had to do what you had to do. So we immediately incorporated, you know, a whole set of covers. We had like 50, 60 covers we could do, all metal. Uh, stuff from SOD to Exciter to uh, Celtic Frost. I mean, the real, you know, dark stuff, along with the, uh, the more accessible uh, metal that, that was popular in the day. Um, I remember uh, John Perez of Saul Tudor Turnus saying to me, my God, your selection of covers is just, how do you, Venom, Exciter, Man of War, <laughs> you know, you mm. like, this is, this is not what the people are really going to see. And we say, ah, we don't care. Well, you know, because we'll get them in with the Kiss and the Scorpions tunes and the, yeah. you know, so, um, anyhow, we, um, that's how we started and we would then slide in our originals, you know, kind of, um, to, to kind of get, get, the, get everybody's, you know, palette wet. Um, and over the years we went from, uh, you know, a, a few, a couple, two, three originals to four or five originals and then to five or six originals. And then to, you know, so we slowly moved it to 25% original, 50% original, 75% original, to now it's like almost 100% original with a, a couple of covers thrown in for, for good measure. Mm -hmm. Seek and um, destroy, seek and destroy. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, so that was, uh, you know, that was the strategy, right? That was the, uh, you know, get them with the stuff you know, build the, the following and then then switch it on them. Um, and it worked to good effect, but with more specifically, you were talking about the, the 91 Department deal. Of Defense. Yeah, um, and um, when we started, like you said, we wore camouflage gear, dog tags. We were all, you know, everybody was, we had this very pro-military look. Behind us on stage would be two American flags, we had dragon launchers, we had camouflage netting, we would throw out uh, dog tags with little toy soldiers or camouflage condoms into the audience. <laughs> nice. um, you know, we were, everything was pro-military and to the, 
you know, we went so far as to make our first album cover on our self-titled uh, Ask a Debut, and a bald eagle, you know, with a flag behind it coming out of a blue and red mist. Um, so it was very, it, it was almost geared to, uh, to you know, stoke your uh, patriotic, uh, you know, desires and, and angst and, and fires and whatnot. And um, one day we were doing a show at the basement in Dallas, and um, we had just finished the show. It was quite successful. We had a lot of people that come see us. And um, at the end of the night, one of my roadies, um, Alan Farrell, comes up to me and says, "Hey, uh, there's this guy over here. He looks, he looks like you know, important, like not your usual club goer. And he wants to talk to you guys. He wants to uh, talk to you about, um, you know, something about touring or night. We're like." Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, man. Just tell him we'll be there in a minute. So, you know, we were doing our thing. We were doing photos and yeah, giving autographs and, you know, talking to the... Looking the, for blondes. <laughs> right. More blondes. <laughs> Some, you know, we, we were just doing the, you know, the after show thing that, that musicians do, you know, night after night around the world. And um, so we kind of put the guy on the back burner. I mean, we had every intention of talking to him, but um, we were otherwise occupied at that moment. And as the uh, minutes wore on, you know, 10 minutes turned to 30 and 30 to 35. And um, next thing you know, Alan comes back, he goes, hey man, the guy's leaving. He's, he's kind of, looks like he's pissed. He's, he's mad <laughs> and he says, uh, you know, when, when you guys get ready to, you know, get real, give him a call and he uses his card. And I, I looked at that thing and go, oh my God, this dude's legit. So immediately I got one of the other guys. I said, come on, man, let's go. Let's go talk to this guy. I think he's real because he's leaving. You know, if he was anybody else, if he was the Godfather, if he was anybody, they'd wait, they'd stick yeah. around, they'd hang out, you know, they'd wait yeah. to talk to you. But some guy that's leaving is, is not a guy that's there to play games or to, uh, you know, play groupie or whatever. I mean, so we went, we talked to the guy, we had a meeting. Um, he uh, told us that, you know, he liked what we were doing and he liked the image very much. Uh, he thought it was tailor-made to, uh, you know, to, uh, raise the morale of troops and hardship locations around the world and whatnot. And uh, we set up a meeting for the following Monday where by the end of that meeting, we had our first deal to go tour overseas for the, um, the USO, Department of Defense, to play for military troops in the desert, which if you remember around that time, 92, 91. Desert Storm. It, yeah, yeah, Desert, desert storm. storm just happened, Desert Shield. Um, and we had still tons of troops stationed there uh, throughout the region, and they basically contracted us to go play for these troops that were there. And they thought that, wow, with this image, this will you know, raise morale. It will, uh, it'll make our, our fighting forces feel good, and you know, and it it, it worked. Um, we went uh, that summer, the summer of '92, which was basically less than a year after our first album came out. Um, we we went out there. We played for the troops stationed throughout uh, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, um, all that region there. And um, before you know it, uh, you know, the tour was over. It was awesome, you know, it was, it was totally cool. And then uh, they, the, they contact, the, the military contacted us, uh, they contacted us and uh, said, hey, you know, that was really cool. You guys did a great job. Everybody loved you guys. Would you like to come back for, at Christmas? <laughs> and that winter, that same year. So we're like, would we like to come back to the desert in winter into Christmas time where they don't even celebrate Christmas? Absolutely, sign us up. We're there, dude. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it went from there, man. We did that for uh, the next eight years, two to three tours, probably about three tours a year nice. uh, for the military. How and many countries did you end up playing? We did well over 40 um, at that time. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm up, up over 60 now, yeah. <laughs> but at that time we did like- Who else can say they played 60 I countries? Know, right? I don't know. I've played one? <laughs> hey, United States? Congratulations. Yeah. Have you, have you oh, played- Oh, no, you played Mexico. I've Mexico? played Mexico. That's, that's right. That's with a trip band. Well, that's, that's two countries. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter what you play with, it's the fact it's that you play. Exactly, you know, exactly. You we're, play. we're all blessed to be able to play, man. Yeah. It's like this, you, you know, if somebody says, do you drive? You say, well, I just have a, a little Toyota. Hey, you, you drive, drive. Yeah, you yeah. drive, you've got a car, you yeah, drive. You know, exactly. So, um, what was the scary moment of, uh, that had to be some scary moments when you're playing those other countries, they have so many strict uh, laws and stuff, or was there anything that really was just like, whoa, um, close? Well, yeah, there were several. Um, I remember in Saudi Arabia, 
we almost got arrested at a mall. Um, you know, most people think of Saudi Arabia, they just think of a desert, right? But it's, it's like anywhere, you know, there's cities and there's, um, you know, there's cities, there's uh, cars and there's civilization <laughs> and it's all in a desert, kind of like Las Vegas, it's yeah. in a desert. Yeah. But so we went to the mall one night, went shopping and uh, it was the evening. Um, and I remember Keith was wearing, some fans had made us these ASCA logo necklaces. They were 24 karat gold and um, they were, it was the logo of the, of the band on these necklaces. And Keith was wearing his at the mall and immediately he was approached by what is known as the Mutawa, which is the religious police in Saudi Arabia that make sure that your hair is cut, that your hair is covered if you're a female, that you're not displaying any uh, symbols of another faith. And they, what they did was they thought that Keith Knight's um, Aska logo was a cross. And he's like, what is, what is this? And what's this hair? And what's, a, you know, I mean, and they were ready to haul us off, you know. Um, thinking, and he was like, no, this is a logo. It's a band logo. It's not a crucifix. It's not a cross. Um, and um, how, what saved us was, um, you know, we, we thought about, man, dude, calm down, hold on a second. And we reach in our stuff and we pull out our, our orders, which basically were an invitation from the, the Shah, the king, or not the Shah, the, um, the king. king yeah, the Fad. king. Yeah. yeah, the king of Saudi Arabia, um, that we were there at his invitation and that we were guests of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and we were guests of the king in accordance with, you know, whatever agreements they had with the U.S. military, and that we were to be left alone, <laughs> not messed with or harassed or whatever. And then when they saw that, they, they backed off and let us go. But they said, you need to, you know, you should cut cover your hair and, mm -hmm. and, and cover that symbol up and this, but they left us alone. Yeah. So it was, it was a close call in, in that uh, instance, you know. Did they, uh, did they make you guys like travel like in Kevlar and you know stuff what? like that? That was a, a different place. That was a different country. Years later, um, we were in uh, we were in Bosnia, Croatia, uh, right after the the Bosnian Serbian mm. Croatian conflict, uh, and um, we were I think we landed in Bosnia and uh, upon arrival they issued us Kevlar helmets, flak jackets, the works, and uh, and a um, an escort they would uh, drive ahead of us, you know, and uh, stop every 30 minutes to and pull out all their mine checking gear and they would, they would scan for mines on the roadway. So we're like, what the hell did we get into, man? But you know, we would look at the buildings, they were all shot up, there were holes in everything. Um, I mean, a war had just taken place here and here we were, you know, playing for people. Um, I remember being on stage in Croatia and we'd be on stage, you know, playing, Whatever wasn't in the background, we hear the, da, 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 you know, machine gun fire, you know, automatic gunfire off in the distance, and we just rolled on through, and we're looking at each other like, what? The hell? Wow! Looking back at the drummer, no drum solo. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> well, you know, through it all, we were never. Um, I, I don't think we were. We were never like, oh man, we're we're so scared or we're afraid. We were just like, ah, bring it on. You know, our spirit was similar to our image, which was, you know, let's just, uh, you know, let's do this. Uh, I mean, here rock we are. Roll, yeah, let's rock and roll. <laughs> that, was our, um, that was our attitude right from the start. I mean, we just wanted to play. We wanted to play and it didn't matter where and we didn't matter. Even if it kills you. Even if it kills us, that's right. <laughs> I mean, I don't think anything that's embraces the- It's irony and it's George, yeah. right? <laughs> Even but, if I mean, you know, heavy metal is all about, you know, all yeah. this imagery, this death imagery and, you know, war and violence and this and that. That's why I can't understand some people today that try to show, oh, no, no, it's so brutal. Oh, guns and all this bad stuff. Did you forget the music you've been listening to for the last 20 years? It's all about raping and killing and sacrifices and demons and devils and, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that for me is the irony. You know, poor people. Yeah, but for lose. those people, it's more imagery. I mean, you were on the real end of it. You know what yeah, I mean yeah, when yeah. you did that tour. For sure, you know it, I mean? was, it was. It was. <laughs> it was certainly. All that stuff could have come true, man. In your case. You yeah, know? yeah. It but, was. Uh, that's you know, cool, man. Um, they actually took us down to uh, what they call Chop Chop Square, which is where they they meet out punishment to criminals. Oh man. Where they chop hands heads, whatever. Wow. And when they saw us there, they immediately brought us down to the front row because they really want foreigners to witness what they do. Um, for some reason or other though, 
uh, you know, we waited, we were there an hour or so, and they called off um, that day's punishments or that week's punishments. They called it off. We were, we were this close to, to watching this stuff up close and personal. It wasn't like going to work. Hoping it wasn't y'all. <laughs> hoping it wasn't y'all. Right. Yeah, no, it wasn't us. No guitar right. players. Yeah, it wasn't us. We were, we were okay. When your name is called, please stand up. <laughs> please come forward. Come to the front. Were you allowed to sell merch on that tour? Were you allowed to sell things in their country, like your CD or shirts? Or you know what? Um, no, yeah. we were not. I didn't think so. We, we, yeah, it was, it was. Like propaganda or what? It, well, it just, we, I, we would it be seen as that? Yeah, we weren't allowed, but, <laughs> you know, we, we were kind of fast and loose with that. Right, right. <laughs> Soldier yeah. Ashley was warning just kind of yeah 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 so you know under the you know <laughs> under the table stuff but what nobody knows uh, you know which I mean it's all out here now but that's all in the past it was you know, yeah in the uh, in the nineties this was all in the nineties and uh, man I'll tell you we really um, cut our teeth and I remember coming back to DFW and seeing that all the clubs had closed all the metal places mm -hmm. were gone I remember um, that. Most of the bands that were metal were gone. They were hits, they were done. Um, and we're like, what the, what's going on here? What, where, I know. Where? It. Yeah, and we'd come back and we'd play and it'd be a packed house, you know? And, and then we'd read the paper, the Dallas was over, oh, metal's dead, metal's dead. Now, like, no, it's not, you know? We're playing and this place is full, you know? Um, so, but we were, we were like the, one of the few lights that were still shining at that time because even the big bands were kind of, Follow the trend, jump on that bandwagon, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Um, you know, Skid Row did their grunge uh, album. Uh, Warren did their grunge-ish album. They're, it's like uh, other bands just shut it down completely. They just closed shop. But uh, a lot of people try. I mean, even Kiss, that Carnival of Souls was a uh, was their attempt at yep. you know following that. I agree. That bandwagon. Metallica did. cut their hair. Metallica did the load and reload. reload. Uh, you know. Uh, um, Megadeth too. They kind of right. Cryptic you know, writings. Every, everybody was on uh, in survival mode. They didn't. You know, it's like the, the scene changed overnight, and we were like, ah, we don't care about that. We're just gonna we're gonna you know bulldoze on through here, playing our style of uh, heavy hair glam metal. Because at, at that time we had three singers, right? Mm -hmm. So we you had three different dudes singing, singing three different styles of metal uh, on the regular. Um, so. What's up? It's Paco from Metalachi, and you're watching Godfather TV. <laughs> I'm Dan. I'm Lance. We're from Edge of Insanity, and you're watching Godfather TV. She's dead again! Once again, I'm Well, your second album, Immortal, was a little lot heavier than the first album, and then one of my favorites. In places, yeah. Yeah, one of my favorites, Nine Tongues. That's the one I first met you and interviewed you for Heart to Beat magazine, and I, I love that album. And then Avenger came out, and that's world, that's worldwide. That's why, right. to me, what put y'all on the heavy metal global map. Even though you already played 40 countries, mm -hmm. the underground metalheads really took to Avenger, and that's the album that you did all the vocals on yeah. for the first time, and y'all were kind of wondering how it was going to go, and it evidently it paid off, right? It really did, um, because up to that point, you know, we'd done three albums. We were doing fine with our military touring, but it really kept us out of the, the attention of of the masses, you know, the civilian world. Nobody knew who we were. I mean, outside of the military circuit. Mm -hmm. Even though we were touring all these places and everything, you know, in general, we were still, you know, nobody knew us. And, um, and we couldn't get a record deal to save our lives. I mean, we got this, uh, you know, for a second album, we got this deal with Statue Records, but it was, 
out of California, but it was nothing, you know, it was garbage. And then, um, you know, so we, we were like, man, what's the deal? Why won't these, uh, why can't we get any label attention? We're doing all these tours and we're, we're our stuff was for sale in the, in the post exchanges, the base exchanges. Um, and uh, what eventually happened was uh, we started reading the reviews that we were getting and they were saying that, wow, you know, this band is really hard to pigeonhole. You know, they're all over the place. They're all over the map. Um, because one minute they sound like, uh, you know, early kiss, and then the next minute they're more accept, and the next minute they sound like ACDC, and then they sound like, you know, so that we, we, um, we basically put that on the, the fact that we had three singers. Um, and most of the reviews were like, now if they concentrated on this style, you know, then it would be great. And those were, generally those reviews were all talking about the songs that I sang. So one day we, you know, we had a band meeting. We said, you know, why don't we try something different? Why don't we do an album where I just take all the vocals, you know, and do them all, and you know, let's listen to the criticisms out there, listen to the the, uh, the critics basically, and, and see what that does. And sure enough, we did it, and we were immediately picked up by Adrenaline Energy Records out of Italy, and they put out the you know the Nine Tongues, and they put out Avenger. And they sub sub licensed that, and that was out in, you know, the Orient, and it was out in the Russian state, the Baltic states, as they call it, um, Europe, and um, that basically got us in the door um, with Avenger. Was the shift in directions? Of course, with that shift also came some um, unpleasantry because our my, the co-founder of Aska, he wanted to sing. He loved singing. Now. At that point, we didn't say, you know, you're no longer going to sing. We're still going to do these songs that we do before. We'll still play them live and whatnot. We'll just, from this point, carrying forward, at least for now, we'll, we'll push forward with me on the, on the vocal. Uh, Avenger was, uh, you know, that, that whole military thing, it was, it was a dual-edged sword in the sense that you know, we were getting paid, we were touring, we were, we were getting our name out there, we were doing some really killer things with, our, with Aska on that end of things, but, but keep in mind this was before the social media. Nobody had Facebook or... MySpace. All, all, MySpace, all MySpace. Things. You know, nobody had that, there, was, there wasn't that form of communication, so um, it was all email back then. Um, so in one way it was great for the band, and in another it was absolutely, um, you know, it held us back, I think, from getting into the scene a little sooner, but who knows? Because maybe there was no scene to get into at that point. It was it was the end of metal as we knew it. You know, yep. it was uh, so. But it wasn't it wasn't dead. It just went further underground. Yeah, you know? it was mm. it was no longer mainstream. You know, right? Well, when I moved here in '94, I came from a small town in Santa Fe, man. I just thought, you know, like George is saying, the metal scene was kind of dead here. To me, it was like insanely good. <laughs> you know, yeah. coming from where I came from, yeah. man, you go, I mean, I, they drove me down to Deep Ellum, you know, the first couple nights I was here, and I was like, wow, man, where, where have I been this whole I, yeah, time? But, you I know, felt the same way. I felt the same way. And I was way. like, wow. But just hearing George say that the metal scene was dead here when he came back from tour, it was like, wow, that's kind of weird that, you know, I came and it was like, wow, it was like, I, that was well, my least I wish favorite, I was here. Least you know? favorite decade was the 90s. Well, yeah, me too. I didn't listen <laughs> to the radio until 97. Going out, I didn't hardly go out any. There was nobody I wanted to see, really. Later in the late 90s, I would go see them and some yeah. other bands. But, but shit, for about five years, I didn't go out. No, of course, my kids were young. But at the same time, I just, nobody wanted to see. I, mean, just, I just didn't like the 90s at all. Everybody, yeah, everybody had just dissolved. You know what, though, uh, Chuck? I, I totally feel what you're saying right there because... Um, what having come here from you know the canal mm -hmm. zone from panama and whatnot um i was like wow this is great this is awesome you know and even that's why and i didn't believe the when the the papers the the local newspapers when i would say oh metal's dead metal's dead i'm like if this is dead dude i'll take it because where i came from we had no concerts we had no metal band. we right. had a few you know bands that would play locally but we didn't have you know like the big uh metal bands that all everybody was loving in the states coming through so just to have what what we were getting here we we're like man they don't know how good they had it right here. right you know um so so like around 2000 is where i guess it started picking up a little bit more right because that's that's when i got into the scene playing drums really i, I moved here in 94 i didn't really play till probably about 98 and i started playing in a cover band and then 2000 came about and that my first gig was at the rock down in 
deep element. I was nervous as hell, man. But uh, that was my introduction to the Dallas music scene. And then I think a few gigs after that is when uh, I was playing with Vintage, a band called Vintage. We actually got to open up for Aska, so that was, that was cool. I thought that was like the biggest thing ever. I get to open up for Aska, you know? But... Uh, was that the show you ran you out on? Because yes, you the George ran us out. They ran us out. They had to do their sound check. Get out and stop. No peeking. No peeking, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But you know, I don't think we personally ran. It wasn't us personally, was it? No, they said it was else. that George guy, man. He just doesn't want you in here. Good they times. really were. And you know, that's uh, that's clearly, that's where I met you. When yeah, we that's where we you. went, yeah. And, I had to um, open up for Asco a few shows with Vintage. I think I opened up a couple times and when I was with Tear. Uh, Probably, yeah, with Tear, yeah, for sure. For sure but yeah. for sure, I remember you from Vintage, and I also remember that when we were looking for a drummer, we were like, you know, we we were open, so we wanted the best of what we'd seen, you know. We so, and Chuck was one of the guys we invited to come try out. Yeah, you know? we had we said him, come on down, Chuck, we want to try you, and he missed one audition, two, two auditions, auditions, three, three auditions. auditions. And we're like, okay, I don't. One think of these days we'll get into know? that, but there, there's there's. <laughs> There's no excuse, okay, but I do have a reason. There's a difference, an excuse and a reason. I have a reason. We, we might touch on that one of these days, but uh, you know, it is what it is. You know, I, but you know, you were new on the scene, yeah, but still, scene, that's but, uh, I, we did like your drumming. We thought I you were a talented that, man. drummer. I appreciate that. Um, I love what you were doing with the when you would play metal guys and you do the yeah, yeah. you know, you throw in that extra. Scott Travis you know, took that for me, by the way. I just he want you he know. really did. I, I saw. I knew you were doing that before he ever did. Right. That's funny. I only saw him start doing that, um, like during the, around the Epitaph tour. Right. So right. Right. Before that, you were the guy that was doing that. Oh yeah. Seriously. I, I mean, I I quite remember. So that. he stole it from you. He stole yeah, it from Scott Chuck. Travis stole that from me. Sure. Yeah. And I know Scott. I yeah. Know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I remember we were in line for the Epitaph tour. We were we were in line to meet Judas Priest. Remember, it was yeah. me and uh, Tim. And Brian Dixon mm -hmm. and Asco, it was it was that was cool. That was one of the best times I've ever had, just hanging out with George and Asco, man. We were just laughing and laughing. We were in line, right, to uh, the, the meet and greet, right? And then after that, we just whoo, lost touch. But one yeah. question I get a lot is, what does Asco mean? It's a it's a Scandinavian word that means ashes. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but of course, for years we also used it as an acronym, right? Um, so, in other words, where each letter stands for something like mm. the military does, you know, D like O D wasp, Department of Defense. Like wasp and kiss wasp, and all yeah. yeah. Well, kiss never actually was. Knights in Satan service. Yeah, but well, people assigned that to it, but they never actually <laughs> did it. But we start, we we did start, you know, it, for us it did mean stuff, you know. So um, and we use we made all kinds of funnies, you know. Arnold Schwarzenegger kicks ass, and then you can let the <laughs> oh, that's a good your imagination <laughs> kick, kick ass. Oh no, yeah, that's so classic. Love them there, but yeah, we had Arnold so many meetings. You know. kicks ass. I, I asked him that question in 1997, and he said, "I would tell you, but I have to kill you." <laughs> oh wow! So that's what that's what you got 25 years ago, but now at least you get it means ashes. It means ashes, but we we demurred in 97 because we were using it as an acronym. Okay. But later, because we we kind of you know nobody knew <laughs> the acronym stuff and whatnot, so. We can't, when we, we're like, yeah, this is an actual word and it actually means something. So we figured it'd just be easier and less explanation to let them know the, the meaning of the word in the Scandinavian countries. Ashes, you know, like from volcanic ash and whatnot. And uh, it's a cool name, you know, cool name for a band. Unfortunately, there's now four or five Askas on the scene. There's a Japanese Aska. There's a, another a Norwegian two-man band, one-man band Aska. There was a, a Yugoslavian Disco act, ask God. <laughs> there's a, oh, nice. Like, Hell, even, even last week when y'all played the rail, there was an ad uh, for that ask, Japanese yeah. guy. And I was like, you what? Ask yeah. It's ask us playing the rail tonight. There's a picture of this Japanese <laughs> the guy. The Japanese guy. We yeah. were like, what is this? Yeah. It's like, I understand if they did that, if that was in America. But, you know, that's, that's the, uh, mm. you know, the... I mean that's populated by Google or something, you know. Yeah, right. Know. And uh, know. they just they default to that guy. It's like, I'm like come that's on, funny. man. We've been around since '91. Right. You know, yeah. since we've had our first album out since '91. Do us the decency of getting the picture correct. You know, not. Uh, you know. I, dude, Arnold Schwarzenegger kicks ass. That's classic. <laughs> classic. Yeah, we had a bunch of those kind of. Yeah. So after um, Avenger, y'all went into Absolute Power, mm -hmm. and that was a. Two, three years, four years between the albums? Uh, it was probably seven. Y'all yeah, did, like, did like hysteria. It came out like seven, yeah. seven years later. It was probably seven years. Um, yeah. But one thing I noticed in those 2003, 2004, somewhere in there, 
was a certain person would always show up at you guys' shows. I guess y'all were his favorite band. A guy named Don Bag Daryl oh, yeah, yeah. would come in at their shows and sit in with them and play covers. And it happened a lot. It wasn't just once or twice. It was quite a bit. Uh, Monte Carlo's, Gilligan's, uh, other places in Arlington. And uh, how'd that come to be? He just was he your fan of yours, or just? I, you know what? I think um, he was. Dime was a fan of metal. Yeah. You know, he loved heavy metal, and he wasn't. He was not just at Asker shows. He was at everybody's show. Yes. I mean, every. I think every show that rolled through town, he was there. Be it uh, mm -hmm. Slayer, Queensrÿche, uh, Def Leppard, uh, Van Halen, Kiss, David Allen Coe. Yeah. You name it, the man was there. He loved music. It was in his. Uh, Bloodstream was in his soul. His dad was a producer. Uh, his brother played with him in the band. He was, uh, you know, arguably DFW's biggest, largest metal export. Um, and so he loved music. And um, I think at our shows, because we were one of those bands that was playing that style of music that he grew up with, you know, and not trying to ride the the grunge or the alternative bandwagon. I think he was, you know, he enjoyed that. He, he liked that a lot. And uh, he would come out and. And um, you know, every time we'd see him, he'd, he'd have a, a an invitation to join us on stage, and we'd get up and play Metallica, mm -hmm. and Ted Nugent, and Kiss. Kiss. And I mean, you can go to YouTube, punch in Dimebag and Aska, and you'll get right. a yeah. string of videos of him um, and Vinny coming to our shows. He, he, I remember he hired us one time to play Vinny's his brother's surprise birthday party at the Big Apple in in uh, Arlington, and. Uh, you know, we had a blast, and he, he had a sign made up, a banner that said, you know, Vinny's, Vinny Paul's, you know, whatever, 42nd birthday party, even though he's much older than that. Yeah. But he goes, it was whatever his birthday party uh, featuring the kings of the 80s, Aska, <laughs> and uh, eat more pussy at the bar. You know, <laughs> you know he, was, uh, he, was, <clears throat> he was truly the madman that everybody portrayed, but in a humorous way. Yeah. I mean, the guy was a prankster through and through. He was fun, he was the life of the party. He loved music, he was a talent unlike any other. And um, he had a way of uh, walking into the room and just lighting the place up. Mm -hmm. used you to know, take um, over. He used to take over that room, man. He I would, yeah, he would, I mean, it, dude, you, wouldn't, you didn't need to look, um, but it's like if you walked in, you knew it because somehow the, just the, the air, the molecules in the air, the mm -hmm. vibe in that room just changed. Um, and it became supercharged. And, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a great guy. He really was. He was a cool guy. And um, I remember a funny story. Um, we were opening for Quiet Riot one night at the uh, Trees in Dallas. And um, sure enough, Dime, Vinny, all the guys were there. And, um, and we had just played, and we were done. Their set, Quiet Riot gets on stage. You know, they start their set. Kevin Dubrow starts singing, you know, ah, ah, ah. and uh, Dime comes right down the front, stands right in front of the stage, front center. He's going, Kevin, Kevin. And, you know, Kevin looks at him and he points, hey, yeah, you know, Dime. And uh, Dime takes off whatever shirt he's wearing and puts on an Asker shirt and he goes, ah. Oh, <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> yeah, that's Kevin's cool. That's cool. <laughs> you know, they just laugh. I mean, what can you do but laugh, right? Yeah. You know? But uh, that was the kind of stuff, that was the kind of thing that Dime loved to do. Yeah, he loved to, you know. Yeah, he was a prankster. Roll you up, yeah. Man, you know, hey, man, he, you know, 50 bucks if you drink this hot sauce, whatever, you know. All right. Um, those guys were, you know, they were insane. Man. The last time I saw Dime, and well, not Vinny, but Dime was... Tier actually opened up for Aska at Monte Carlo's, and there's video of it. So not of uh, Tier playing, but of Dime playing with you guys that night. And I remember that was uh, he came in, and you you think Dime at that point was a rock star, you know what I mean? It was through, during through. the Damage Plan days. This is right before the Damage Plan album was released, and he comes in the door, no guitar case, just his chords in hand with the guitar, <laughs> and he just puts them on the floor like he's just one of the guys, you know, and. Like, like he's, he's late, band. like he's late for sound check. You know what I mean? Yeah. Am I and, late? Uh, yeah. He did. He ended up just putting his car down and Jaeger all night for five. Yeah, first he would, he would go to the bar and he'd pick. He'd buy a tray yep. and, and he would walk around. Right every single person that was there, it might be a twenty people there, it might be on a Wednesday night. You never knew when he was, when he was going to show up. Right. But he would just hand out drinks to everybody. It was. He lived. That, he lived the lifestyle. Yeah, he I did mean, for sure. I mean, hundred percent. But that night, I remember is that. Uh, 
he told one of his guys, I forgot who it was, he goes, uh, hey, go to the car and get the, get the CD. I didn't know what he meant. I thought maybe it was just something that he wanted to throw on. Turns out that he goes, uh, somebody went up to the mic and said, hey, we're going to let you guys listen to the damage plan demo. So everybody in that bar got to hear the damage plan demo before it was even, it was even mixed down. It was just rough tracks. And mm -hmm. We all got to hear that man and uh, that he, he died soon after that. But it was cool just to be a part of that, you know, and just to be in the same room as that energy, you know, Dime and, and Vinny both. And it was cool, man. Good times with Dime. Yeah, yeah. he was a great guy, man. Yeah. He, was, he was truly one of a kind, unique uh, personality. One thing Aska used to do that was different than everybody else was, um, there was no social media, of course, so to get people to come to the shows back then, it ain't like Hollywood where you just start stapling shit everywhere. <laughs> they mailed postcards to your house <laughs> and told you when their next show was going to be. Had their logo and it said what time they were no playing. No calendars either, just no, the one show. Just the one show. We're playing here in three weeks. Be there. Here's the <laughs> opening bands. Here's the slot and some clever saying. And yeah. if you were on their mailing list, you got one every single time. And it was really smart because people knew to show up. You didn't just hope they saw the ad somewhere on the wall or the, the record store or whatever. You got one in the mail personally to you. Yeah. And uh, that made a big difference. I thought that was really smart back in those days. Um, we, we had a lot of techniques that were, you know, we had invented or worked on to get, to maximize our turnouts. So you did know? you guys have like a street team type? Uh, team no, no, or was it was it, just us. Did you guys do it, it just, yourself? It was us, yeah. That's, we, that's commitment, we, man, because yeah. bands, they, they talk, you know, there's a lot of bands I that talk a good could, game. I think bands could, should still do that No, no, but what I'm saying is... It's expensive, though. Yeah, yeah it is. It's, it's, it's cost-prohibitive, yeah. yeah. That's why we stopped. It wasn't because we wanted to. It's just because, man, you, what, you're going to pay almost a dollar per one. And we keep in mind, our mailing list is <laughs> probably 1,000 people on it, 500 people or whatever. I mean, every night we'd play, we'd sign people up on the mailing list. Yeah. I mean, we'd make we'd make sure that our roadies would go out, get addresses, get names, get numbers, get addresses yeah. for the mailers. Anybody that's, that came out tonight, and um, it just became. I mean, back then it was what, fifteen cents, twenty cents yeah, to mail a postcard. Yeah, twenty-five. That adds up if you mail a thousand of them. But yeah, <laughs> but once you start doing a, a map, you know, and of course we were, you know, we had. This is our Houston area people. This is our Houston area, our Austin area. Right. This is this area, you know. But in DFW, we had a huge mailing list. And uh, after a while, it just became, you know, with the advent of the internet and social media, we're just like, well, just put it out there. It's cheap. It's free. Um, but it, it doesn't have the same impact. No, no, it doesn't. You know? So either spend the money and, and have a larger impact. But well, we'd, already, we'd already done it for years. So, yeah. like, man, we're not going to spend another, you know, eat up the entire take of the show sending out mailers. Yeah. You know? Because the clubs weren't paying for it. We would pay for this. You know, and that's, I think, a lot of the mistakes that the, some of the newer bands tend to make, certainly back then, was that they would, well, we've got the manager and he's going to do everything for us. Or we've got the record label and they're going to do everything. Or we've got a street team. And they would delegate all these things to other people. And who cares more about you than you? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, if you're not going to do it, what makes you think that they're going to do it? You think some manager that's worth the salt is really going to be sitting around there um, cooking up ideas to get people out to your show or, you know, going around putting flyers up at the place. No, heck no. Now, that said, you asked about street team. We did have, on occasion, there would be girls that would pop in and out of our lives that would do that kind of thing. They would go out and paper flyers. They would um, push the band. They would uh, do that, those kinds of things, you know, of their own volition for us. Right. But we made the flyers, we did the mailers, we did the handwritten. From, we'd go on tour and we'd buy a stack of postcards in whatever country we were in and we'd send a you know, handwritten postcard to whoever it was on the mailing list. You know? And we, we divided up four ways and they each guy just start writing a handwritten note to whoever that fan was. It, these, these were it's that's what we did. It was just part of what we did. That's awesome. Yeah, that's good, good marketing for sure. And George always gave the new bands a a chance. Uh, my son Taylor, most of y'all know, was just turned 15. Four, they were 14 and 15 year old kids. They were in a band called Revengeance. And George says, put them on, on our show next Saturday at Monte Carlo's, you know, get their feet wet and like that. And it was really a big deal to Taylor and them to, to play with Aska. And uh, well, the funny story that night was Aska used to do a, a song on, on, for Breaking the Law, but it was Show Us Your Tits. 
and girls showed their tits. And every night, every time we These played. kids were 14 and 15 with their parents in the crowd. Their very first show to ever play, and they're just like, no more, you're not playing with that. They're anymore. like, oh my God, what is going on here? And there's at least five <coughs> girls on guys' shoulders with their tops up. This is just a regular club, you know, and there's, <laughs> I'll never forget that. The, the looks on their mom's faces and asking me, is that going to be every time they play? I'm like, oh. every time they play See, with us? No, I yeah, ask. only only when they play with George. Yeah. That's that's why Taylor's made the career choice he's made. Yeah, exactly. He was corrupted early. <laughs> he's like, on. I'm going to keep doing this. Right, but right. yeah, he, he gave him a chance, and I think you're even going to. Be singing on the new Dreamkeeper album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time has went by in twenty, you know, twenty something years now almost, and he's got he's going to get George to do part of a track or on a track on the next Dreamkeeper album. Yeah, so yeah. that's coming up. You're soon. welcome, Taylor. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> doing yeah, doing a guest with the uh, guest appearance on his album. You know what's uh, what's funny though is all of that nudity that used to occur at our shows and, and most rock shows in general. Mm -hmm. um, Stop. It stopped like this with the advent of the internet. With yep. Facebook, social media, whatnot. Nobody wanted, you know, these girls didn't want grandpa, <laughs> uncle Jim, you know, uh, B uh, cousin Bob, all these people seeing them, the things they were doing in these nightclubs, you know, the next day, plastered all over social media. I think that happened to a few people a couple of times before it, oh, that's it went the way of, yeah. They there's just, also some people that don't care, you know. Yeah. Even to this day, I. Kill them all shows. It happens. You yeah, know? yeah. Once happen. in a while, it doesn't happen all the time, but it still happens. I, I just don't think it's like it was. Oh no, because, no, no. no. It was, it, yeah, it was just rampant. Because literally, they'd be going, "Show us your tits, show us your tits," and they'd be like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. "It was great." Well, back in the day, it was, it was like you know, you know, you yeah. had to go, man. Let's hope the film develops. Let's hope yeah. the film develops. <laughs> it's not uh, like yeah, that now. It was crazy. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was pretty. Uh, it was blatant. It was in your face. And they were all doing, they would throw panties on stage, bras. They would strip. They would, not just tits, but I mean, I've, yeah. we've seen everything on stage. I've uh, thrown some panties up on stage before at <laughs> one of Georgia's shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, it, you know, that kind of disappeared. It, it uh, just with the advent of the internet, it kind of went away. And then we stopped calling for it, too, because we're yeah. like, eh, we don't want to get anybody in trouble. Yeah, exactly. Right? You know, but um, it was... Uh, <laughs> All right, so we've delved into Aska's only part of their career. We could be talking all night about all Aska, night. but... We do have a new album coming out. Yeah, the seventh album is coming later this year. It is. Yeah, there's no set release date, but it's coming. It's done. It's recorded. It's finished. It's not vaporware. It's not talk. It is done. It's called Night Strike. It's got uh, ten songs on it. Thing kills. Um, it's I, by far... And everybody that's heard it, including everybody in the band, says it's our best album to date. Now, if you know, some bands like Van Halen started with their best album and then, you know, progressively <coughs> did whatever they did. Um, us, we went the opposite way. We started real shitty. <laughs> our first album was not so good, but we got better as we went. And, uh, and this album is truly the culmination. Of the, uh, I mean, it's the years of experience of, you know, being on tour, playing with so many other bands, uh, you know, being in other bands, and, when I, and uh, it really comes together with this new record. I can't wait for people to hear it. I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, I'm so pumped for that. It's I'm really so killer. Night Strike, it's called. Night Strike, cool. Night Strike. Well, good. Oh. My name's Corey. I work at Amplified Live, and you're watching Godfather TV. This is Bobby with Amplified Live, and I want you to watch Godfather TV. Bye. Hey, this is Rich from Metonic, and you are watching Godfather TV. But anyways, okay, well, I'm Chuck Insinius. This is the Godfather, Jeff Dennis. Thank you to George Call for coming on. Thanks for having me. And DFW, uh, we'll see you out in the scene. I'm going to leave you with these four letters, M-U-Y-A. See ya. Metal up your Aska. <laughs> Are we good? Al? Well, you guys keep talking.